What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Dunk of Up Shit Podcast. This is uh third heritage episode, number three. <laughs> Finally got around to another one. I had a different idea and haven't got through the book yet. So I'm going with uh, one of my favorite characters, if you will, uh, from naval history. A little more recent than some of the ones I talk about normally uh and it's bm1 james e williams you'll hear me go back and forth between calling him bm1 in chief and that's just because after his career he was made an honorary chief so you'll see pictures of him out there wearing his medal honor and wearing a chief's uniform and it's it's like he didn't actually advance to chief on active duty he was made an honorary chief later on but uh either way it's you'll hear me go back and forth just because of some of the resources i used so just be aware of that. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to talk about this one. I, it's funny how many influential bosun's mates I have <laughs> in my life since starting this podcast um, that, you know, I don't really interact with them on submarines. We have just guys that do the detective and, and top side stuff is almost like a collateral duty because the ship's so small and we just don't need a full time deck department. And then they do a lot of other wild stuff like Jeff Bayless has talked about, like launching and retrieving LCACs or whatever and like they do a lot of cool stuff um and i've i've grown to know and love them so uh this one was fun and he's a guy that i've always admired and just thought his story is really interesting especially from the perspective of he did all this as a first class petty officer uh and i'll get into why i think that's so cool uh here in a minute but uh, when I get to the, I'll update the website and also all the references will be uh, in the show notes that I used for this. Uh, a lot of them are pretty common stuff, just websites and Wikipedia and the History and Heritage Command, especially. Um, but just the, they'll be in the description if you want to check those out uh, yourself. So, how did a young Cherokee boy grow to become one of the U.S. military's greatest heroes? you say that it sounds like hyperbole a little bit but it's it's not and and we'll get to that and i'll list all his awards and you'll understand that mo and most of this happened at the very end of his career um but the very first thing he did (laughs) to allow this whole story to unfold was in 1947 he convinced a county clerk to falsify a birth certificate so he could join the navy at, at the tender young age of 16 years old um, his first tour was uneventful, and I'm going to read a quote about an experience that he hated at the time, but he learned from. So he said, I joined the Navy to see the world, and doggone it, I wasn't moving. <laughs> I had gotten orders to a landing ship tank uh, that just sat around a buoy in San Diego Harbor. And then he said, an old chief told me, son, you got to learn to take orders, even if you disagree with them. That's the first step to being a good sailor and a good leader. If you can't take orders now, you certainly won't be respected when you give them later. Well, I got the message, he said. Learning discipline was the springboard that helped my naval career. From then on, I had the sharpest damn knife and the shiniest shoes in the Navy. That's what I was taught. Uh, I thought that was really cool. And uh, BM1 Williams was a humble hero that at the end of his career volunteered for the hardest possible duty. And he did so as one of the things that we kind of talk about as like a and I say this hesitantly but I just want people to understand that sometimes sailors that make it to the end of their career without ever advancing to chief either beat themselves up about it or other sailors kind of look at them like well why didn't they and like almost like it's a problem or, or they did something wrong BM1 Williams was at the end of his career he was about to retire and he volunteered for the hardest possible duty, commanding two small boats in combat in Vietnam, where he would become the most decorated sailor in history. That's wild. And it's significant because I find that that kind of stereotype might not be the right word, but the kind of the negative connotation or, or whatever that a first class retiring at 20 years can uh, be sp- be spoke about on and and again like this isn't my belief system it's just something i've seen over my over my time and experience it's that oh like oh if they didn't at least make chief then they weren't trying hard enough or they didn't do the right things or maybe they got in trouble and there's always like some negative connotation to the the if or why and i wanted to point out that that's not true like it's not real it's not a thing and some of it's just our own insecurities like I talked about on the last spin the yarn about like how I felt this need to be a cob and a CMC because I, I felt like I needed other people's validation. I felt like I needed to prove things to people. Um, and I just think this is a this this person 
is a really great example of that not being true that first classes in leadership roles are just as important as chiefs just as important as officers everybody's got a role to play and in this particular scenario james williams played a pretty significant role so much so that there's a ship sailing around the navy named after him right now and we're going to talk about the the hows and whys but james elliott williams wasn't looking for medals when he went to vietnam even though he ended up with nearly all of them including the medal of honor he just wanted to show that quote he had something else between the ears other than his ability to chip paint and salute and he got that opportunity and more so uh Chief Williams, and again, I mentioned as I, I'm going to go back and forth, but uh, he was born in because he was an honorary chief. But I'll go, so I'll go back and forth, title wise. But uh, born in Fort Mill, South Carolina, and moved two months later with his parents to Darlington, South Carolina, where he spent his early childhood and youth. Uh, he attended the local schools and graduated from St. John's High School in 1949. Williams married former Elaine Weaver, and they had five children: daughter Debbie, sons James E. Jr., Stephen Michael. Charles E. and daughter Gail and seven grandchildren in 1947 again he joined the Navy when he was only 16 Um, it feels like that's a little more common back in the day like as I do research on history topics of all kinds especially back in like World War II or World War I it was even Civil War like you go back to the revolution like there was a lot more common I actually just recently did a lot of research about how uh, women served in combat roles in the revolution and Civil War so look that up it's interesting (laughs) Uh, but in his 19 years of service on active duty, uh, he served in both the Korean and Vietnam Wars, and his experience was rewarded with more responsibility. Williams commanded uh, River Patrol Boat 105, but also another PBR uh, through murky waters of Mekong Delta. The patrol was nothing new for Williams uh, and the crew of PBR 105. Many of the patrols in that area were met with enemy resistance and served to season the crew members of PBR 105. Uh, Williams and his crew obtained high value intelligence data following successful engagements, earning Williams two bronze stars and the silver star. Uh, In Vietnam, Williams was assigned to River Patrol Force, whose mission was to intercept enemy arms shipments on the waterways south of Vietnam's Mekong Delta. On 31 October 1966, Williams, who was patrol commander for his riverboat, and it previously mentioned 105, and another PBR were searching the Viet Cong operating in an isolated area of the Mekong Delta. Suddenly, guerrillas in two sampans, which are a type of boat in Vietnam, opened fire. Uh, Williams and his crew neutralized one boat crew, and the other escaped to a nearby canal. As they gave chase, the PBR sailors soon found themselves in a beehive of enemy activity. Viet Cong guerrillas fired rocket-propelled grenades and small arms from a fortified riverbank. Uh, and against seemingly overwhelming odds, Williams led his PBRs against enemy junks, which is another form of, of kind of barge boat uh, that they used in Vietnam, and sampans, while calling in air support. When the Huey helicopters and Navy helicopter attack light squadron three arrived, he led another attack that evening, turning on his boat's searchlights to expose enemy forces and positions. After the three-hour battle was complete, the American naval force killed numerous Viet Cong guerrillas, destroyed more than 50 vessels, and disrupted a major Viet Cong logistical operation. On 14 May 1968, President Lyndon Johnson presented Williams the Medal of Honor for his extraordinary heroism and exemplary fighting spirit in the face of grave risks inspired the efforts of his men to defeat a larger enemy force. And I'm going to read his Medal of Honor citation for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Petty Officer First Class Williams was serving as boat captain and patrol officer aboard River Patrol Boat PBR 105, accompanied by another patrol boat when the patrol was suddenly taken under fire by two enemy sampans. Petty Officer First Class Williams immediately ordered the fire returned, killing the crew of one enemy boat and causing the other sampan to take refuge in a nearby river inlet. Pursuing the fleeing sampan, the U.S. Patrol encountered a heavy volume of small arms fire from enemy forces at close range, occupying well-concealed positions along the riverbank. Maneuvering through this fire, the patrol confronted a numerically superior enemy force aboard two enemy junks and eight sampans augmented with heavy automatic weapons fire from ashore. In the savage battle that ensued, Petty Officer First Class Williams, with utter disregard for his safety, exposed himself to the withering hail of enemy fire to direct counterfire and inspire the actions of his patrol. 
Recognizing the overwhelming strength of the enemy force, Petty Officer First Class Williams deployed his patrol to await the arrival of armed helicopters. In the course of his movement, he discovered an even larger concentration of enemy boats. Not waiting for the arrival of the armed helicopters, he displayed great initiative and boldly led the patrol through the intense enemy fire and damaged or destroyed 50 enemy sampans and 7 junks. This phase of the action completed, and with the arrival of the armed helicopters, Petty Officer First Class Williams directed the attack on the remaining enemy force. Now virtually dark, and although Petty Officer First Class Williams was aware that his boats would become even better targets, he ordered the patrol boat searchlights turned on to better illuminate the area and moved the patrol perilously close to shore to press the attack. Despite a waning supply of ammunition, the patrol successfully engaged the enemy ashore and completed the rout of the enemy force. Under the leadership of Petty Officer Williams, who demonstrated unusual professional skill and indomitable courage throughout the three-hour battle, the patrol accounted for the destruction or loss of 65 enemy boats and inflicted numerous casualties on the enemy personnel. His extraordinary heroism... An exemplary fighting spirit in the face of grave risks inspired the efforts of his men to defeat a larger enemy force and are in keeping with the finest traditions of the United States Naval Service. In addition to the Medal of Honor, Williams received during his 20-year career the Navy Cross, Silver Star with one Gold Award Star, the Legion of Merit with a Valor Device, the Navy and Marine Corps Medal with a Gold Star. It's a peacetime Medal of Honor, effectively, for those that don't know what that is. Bronze Star with two gold stars, Vietnam Cross of Gallantry with gold star and palm, Navy Commendation Medal, Navy and Marine Corps Presidential Unit Citation with one service star, Purple Heart with two gold stars, Vietnam Service Medal with bronze service star, Republic of Vietnam Campaign Medal, National Defense Service Medal with bronze service star, United Nations Service Medal, Korean Service Medal with two bronze service stars, Korean Presidential Unit Citation, Korean War Service Medal, and the Navy Good Conduct Medal with four bronze service stars so literally every valor award that that we have it's incredibly impressive uh during a 1997 interview uh with a norfolk based newspaper the virginian pilot williams described the day's patrol as a relax and recreation <laughs> patrol as opposed to the more dangerous night operations the crew still alert and ready jumped into action when the two high-speed Viet Cong vessels were spotted and then after disabling one vessel, another slipped into the canal, as mentioned previously, and the two patrol boats followed. And this detour uh, is what led them into that staging area. And Petty Officer Williams is quoted as saying, looking at the map, I could see where he had come out. I turned hard right to wait for him. As I did that, lo and behold, we found a big staging area. All I could see were boats and people. They were shooting at us from the right and from the left, and we were shooting. They were doing more of hitting each other than we were. <laughs> So they basically were getting sh like shooting at themselves because they were on each like uh, shoreline on each side. And they were shooting across the the water area to sh hit each other, <laughs> according to Petty Officer Williams. Both boats, guided by Williams' tactics and command, evaded through the staging area. And he said, "We got through that, and I'm trying to zigzag." Said Williams, "I go by a couple more corners and turn into this area. Lo and behold, we hit the second staging area." Both boats, with eventual assistance from the helicopter gunships, as we mentioned earlier, fought the Viet Cong, and the engagement resulted in the American forces killing more than a thousand Viet Cong guerrillas, and then, as mentioned in his citation, more than 60 vessels. Uh, while this engagement was just one of the heroic actions Williams performed, it was this day that it earned him the Medal of Honor. Uh, the 105 crew, this is coming from Williams again, the 105 and the crew were always into something or another <laughs> we weren't looking for it i was just doing a job to the best of my ability i wasn't out there trying to win medals e events just happened um some of his legacy after this f after this happened because there's a lot of crazy stories where some of the some of the things he got the navy marine corps medal was some craziness where he like jumped in and saved a guy from a sinking vessel like his his career is absolutely absurd and a lot of it happened in a very short period of time uh, during the v Vietnam War at the end of his career. Um, following 20 years of active duty, Williams made an, uh, was made an honorary chief and went on to serve as a U.S. Marshal. Uh, Williams retired from the U.S. Marshal Service in 1983 as a GS-15 and uh, on October 13th, 1999. And if you don't recognize that date, coincidentally, the Navy's 224th birthday, Williams passed away at the age of 68. 
He's buried at the Florence National Cemetery in Florence, South Carolina. The uh, as I mentioned before, also the most decorated enlisted sailor in U.S. Navy history, Williams left a legacy and an example for everybody. And one of those things is an Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyer named after him, the USS James E. Williams DDG 95. Uh, and from an article, uh, the commanding officer. I, I, he may still be the commanding officer because they're talking about COVID and stuff in this quote, but he said, you will find no other crew that works harder than this one. And of course, the CEO is going to say that, but <laughs> I won't challenge him. The commanding officer, the James E. Williams, the most recent deployment took a lot of resiliency and fortitude. The crew excelled in the mission, all in this COVID-19 environment. They took care of the ship and each other. The James E. Williams, currently in a maintenance phase, spent 317 days of 2020 away away from their naval station home port. Nevertheless, the crew succeeded at the deployment's taskings. That is forever. 317 days. I I joke about the special project submarine I was on. We were gone about 300 days a year on average, but not straight. That's, wow. That is forever. I wonder if that is consecutive. Um, But that is a long time to be away from home. So the Command Master Chief uh, says, William's legacy is do your best and be the best. Uh, this is Command Master Chief William Worthen, uh, and he's the CMC of the James E. Williams. These are some of the most resilient warriors that I've ever been around. No matter the size of the job, they will find a way to get it done. His Medal of Honor is, uh, citation is primarily displayed on the Mestex, uh, providing sailors a daily reminder of BM1 Williams legacy. Uh, his example allows ordinary people to evolve and do extraordinary things, said Norris. Um, that's a great quote just because it, it's one of those, like, as I mentioned earlier, him being a first class with a, it, what he said was an uneventful career up to a certain point. I mean, he served in the Korean War as well. Uh, and I couldn't find as much detail on that, but, and I really wish somebody would write a book about this. Maybe I'll do it when I retire, but. I couldn't find a, a book to go through. That's usually how I, I formulate these podcasts. And he was actually offered a movie deal uh, and turned it down. But uh, it he serves as a very powerful motivator and lets sailors connect with the lives and struggles that have gone before them. It helps sailors realize that perhaps their struggle is not new and others have overcome struggles of their own. And that, again, was from Norris, um, who the commanding officer that I mentioned earlier of the James E. Williams. And uh, it just this one it's a little shorter than I I wanted it to be because I couldn't find as much out there. Like I couldn't find a book on the life of James E. Williams. And if somebody knows about one, like please help me out, (laughs) shoot me a link. I'd really, I'd really love to read it. Um, but he's got an incredible late life and legacy. Uh, and I think it's really, really important to share this story. And especially with your first class petty officers, because to me, he is, a first class petty officer exemplar to steal my buddy Dan's uh, term when he, he would talk about what he, how he used to view chiefs um, and to a certain extent does just picks and chooses, but that's a totally different topic. It's it for me, if you're looking for an exemplar within the first class petty officers mess, it's James E. Williams. And I think it's something that it's really important. First classes are aware that this guy did the things that he did. He's the most decorated sailor in the history of the Navy And he did all these incredible things as a first class petty officer that was like just about to retire. And he volunteered for the hardest job, was put in these positions and without ever putting anchors on until after the, you know, after he gets out of the Navy and we wanted to start claiming him as an honorary chief. Right. Like he retired as a first class petty officer. He did all these incredible things as a first class petty officer and he merited a ship being named after him based on his incredible legacy and contributions to what we do as a first class petty officer. And that's something that collectively is a mess. You all in the first class petty officer associations out there, messes or whatever you want to call them. Anybody wearing three chevrons to work should take a lot of pride in and understand that, that it's not limited to just you. It's not a thing that you should ever like let go of that understanding that your contributions are huge. And if you haven't listened to the, first there were first episode i will link that in the description as well Uh, i'm a pretty big fan of this concept and i wish we talked about it more um (laughs) i'm gonna read a like a few more things like he had so many good quotes like he's just one of those guys that every time 
I would read something. I'm like, oh God, I gotta, I gotta cover that too. So one of it's like for a ninth grade dropout who thought of the Navy as quote my second mommy and daddy <laughs> or second mom and daddy. Uh, this was an opportunity to show that as a senior enlisted man, he had something more to give w- in volunteering to go to Vietnam at the very end of his career. Like he was real close to retiring. He looked at it. And this is his quote. I looked at it as an opportunity to do something better. So did all the others. That is why the PBR was so successful in Vietnam. The men were so proud. Uh, and he didn't. And this is what I mentioned earlier. He didn't covet publicity. He turned down offers for a movie based on his Medal of Honor exploits, feeling that too much dramatic license would be taken. As he said in an interview with the Post and Courier newspaper of Charleston, South Carolina in 1990, if you're not going to tell the truth about the battle, then it ain't worth telling. Um I just this dude I'm such a fan and then in an all hands magazine uh, where he was interviewed he said the proudest day of my life had nothing to do with medals ribbons and citations it was when they made me a patrol officer that position was held only by chiefs and officers it showed the trust the Navy had placed in me I always wanted the opportunity to show what I could do and this Vietnam thing was it for me the Navy gave me a chance to do my job I, br- I wanted to read those things to reinforce that point. You don't need anchors to lead people. You don't need anchors to make the impact that you always wished you could. You just need to go where leadership opportunity exists. And that's exactly what Williams did. It took till the very end of his career to show what he wanted to show and make the impact that he wanted to make. Um, and I'm, I'm basing that statement on those, those things that I read. Uh, during this podcast but just like this guy it he went where he was needed and he did what needed doing and it's super impressive to me and I, it's one of those things that like I, f- I feel like we get caught up sometimes in the idea that you have to like uh, Hackworth that Colonel David Hackworth he wrote a book called um, About Face it's an r- incredible book that I haven't even finished yet because it's gigantic about uh, Vietnam he was a army, I forget, like a brigade commander. Like I, I forget the level, but he was in charge of a bunch of soldiers of Vietnam. Uh, I apologize for my lack of fluency in, <laughs> in army uh, unit sizes, but he called them ticket punchers, like the people that just go into a place and do a thing to check a box for promotion sake right and like there's these things that are looked for when we're promoting and it's like we got to get that thing on my eval but i'm not doing it because i care about the people and i'm not doing it because i care about the mission I'm doing it because i care about punching my ticket so that i can promote and then as soon as that's done i can walk away and not care about any of those things um and i, I feel like a lot of times even though it's not malicious just based on how the system is set up i have a buddy that constantly says that uh, i think it's actually paul Kingsbury says that um, like the precepts and and this, all the documentation that that details what a selection board's looking for drives performance. He's like you whatever that thing says, whatever that document says is what people are going to go do. So if we make volunteer s- stuff important, people are going to go do a ton of volunteer work. And if we make college important, people are going to prioritize college. They're going to prioritize that inevitably at the expense of something else. And so you'll see if you look around the internet long enough. A lot of people that are talking about uh, like the the sailors that promote are doing all the other things that you see in those documents, but they're not going where leadership opportunity exists and doing what needs doing. What I find is that the people that end up making the biggest impact, and I say that with the understanding that sometimes the biggest impact doesn't mean the most promotions. The people that make the biggest impact are the people that go where leadership opportunity is and do what needs doing. They lead people and I will happily walk away with less promotions or less prestige or less whatever awards and all the other things that Williams talked about not being that important to him because I got the opportunity to go where that leadership opportunity was and do what needed doing and see the impact that was made and get the reward of, of that, the satisfaction that comes with like, helping those people and doing what needed to be done and being the resource or getting them the resource or helping them or teaching them or training them or whatever so that they could go on and do great things and execute the mission. And and I think that's kind of what I got out of, out of him saying that this was his opportunity. 
like he always wanted an opportunity to show what he could do and that the Navy gave me a chance to do my job. I think his interpretation of what his job was, was going where the leadership opportunity was and doing what needed to be done. And he did. And he's a legend as a result. Not that that's what he was seeking, but that's a recognition that comes with you seeking out leadership opportunity and doing the things that need doing. And they're hard things. They're always going to be hard things when you go to where you're needed the most um, because it be, that by nature of that need existing, addressing that need is going to be hard, especially if you're seeking out the absolute hardest assignments, like the place where you're needed the most is going to be the most difficult job you ever do. Um, but that's where the impact is going to be made as well. That's where you're going to get the chance to show what you can do and the, the, that's where the Navy's going to put you in responsibility of things and allow you to do your job and make a significant lasting impact. Um, gigantic fan of the story. I wish it would have got made into a movie because I think it would have been incredible. Uh, maybe it still will someday, but um, big fan of the story. Uh, if you if, Again, if anybody has resources out there, especially books, I'd be super interested to hear from you. But uh, as always, if you need anything from us, Hit us up, don't give up the show podcast at gmail.com. You can Facebook message us, don't give up the show podcast, or you can DM us on Instagram or Reddit at DGUS Podcast. Uh, hit me up and let me know what you think. I, I, I'd be interested to hear from the first classes that are listening as well um, and get some discussion going about the kinds of things that you may take away from this or may passionately disagree with. Uh, I, in the vein of like that maybe in today's modern Navy that this type of opportunity doesn't exist anymore. I would disagree, but I would understand why you feel that way. So it, it'd be something I'd be, I'd be very interested to talk to you all about. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, if you, if you want to have any feedback or questions or comments or, or want to just kind of engage in that kind of a dialogue, hit us up. I'd be really interested to talk about it. I, I'm, I find myself spending more time, kind of analyzing the role of the first class petty officer and the importance of it and w the fact that we don't leverage it like I feel like we can and I definitely feel like we used to I feel like we used to lean a lot harder on our first classes than we do now and I feel like that some of that role transferred to the chief and I don't think it should have so uh, I feel like there's an interesting conversation there. I'll probably talk about this more uh, as I continue to clarify my thought process on it. But uh, And that's it. That's what I got for you today. Thank you so much for listening. And don't give up the ship. <laughs>